Welcome to Fall City Christian Church. The stainless worship this morning. Rumors of the Son of Man. Stories of a Savior. Holiness with human hands. Treasure for the traitor. No ear at her, no eye had seen. The image of the Father. Until heaven came to live with me. A rescue like no other. City Christian Church. We are so excited you guys are here. Let's take a moment and let's uh, love on each other. Hug a father and hug a mother. If you like.
You guys knew, but in this solo cup is a root beer float. We have tons and tons and tons of root beer floats out here. Make sure you guys, fathers, mothers, anybody that wants one, really. Um, this is just a celebration of today and um, of today being for our fathers and, and uh, most importantly, for our good, good father in heaven. We're going to take some time worshiping today, and um, we have a special guest speaker here this morning, Drew Dawson. He's come to uh, bring the message of, of hope and joy and love and um, of what it means to, to be in God's presence. So we're excited and, and for you to be here, excited that um, God brought you and your families here this morning to worship with us um, in maybe a way that you're not used to and maybe a way that you're accustomed to. So uh, we just invite you and welcome you um, in this. We're also going to... Uh, um, later on, offer some tithes and offerings and also worship him in communion. And um, so we welcome you to uh, participate in that. And uh, before we get started, though, we are going to sing to our Father. We're going to lift him up this morning. Um, let's lift him up with good, good Father. Will I ever a thousand stories of one? They think you're like, but I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. You tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Well, I see many searching for answers. Far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Who you 
are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who I am, it's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Amen. We're going to take some time. We're going to sing about what we believe, but we're also going to uh, worship him with tithes and offerings. So this is, a, this is a time for you to give back a portion of what he's so graciously giving you. Um, just in the small um, life of this church, and basically a year ago, we've been able to help so many families and so many people in this community. A lot of people in this church um, that have call, fallen on hard times or that just have, have needed to pick me up. And uh, it's just awesome that we've been able to support this church um, and also support the ministries around it. So thank you for being a part of that. And uh, let's sing to him what we believe.
believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Do you all believe that? So much power in the name of Jesus. So much strength, so much hope, and so much joy. Scripture says, in the beginning was Jesus, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that all things exist through Him. All things exist because of Him. All things exist by Him and for Him. A lot of times it's hard to wrap our heads around that because we're so selfish. And to realize it's not about us, it's about God and about his plan for us. A God that was so loving and wanted a relationship with us so bad that he would offer up his only son as a sacrifice to pay the sin debt that man had brought upon the world. We celebrate in that death. We celebrate in that burial. We celebrate in the resurrection this morning. We celebrate the fact that we have a father that calls us his sons and daughters. A father that calls us out of the darkness. It calls us his own, even though we may not deserve it, even though we don't deserve it. He sent his only son, Jesus, to be an example, an example of love, an example of how we're to live, an example of how we're to love one another, an example of how we're to love our communities and even the people that don't love us back. And as a father myself, the thought of giving one of my sons is unbearable. It's unfathomable. And the fact that he would freely hand him over, and Jesus knew that this was his job all along, but he knew how important the relationship between humans and God was. Being a human himself. But it was so much for God to bear that he had to turn his back as Jesus gave up his spirit, as Jesus suffered, because it was his son dying on that cross for you. We're going to take time right now to remember that sacrifice as we do each week, as Jesus instructed us to do before he left. We eat the bread that represents his body that was broken, and we drink the cup that represents his blood that was poured out in remembrance of him, in remembrance of death, but also in remembrance of the resurrection and the life. Because Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Take this time and worship. However you see fit, if you need to stand, if you need to sit, if you need to just rest in him and take him in, this is your time. God, we thank you so much for this moment, for the opportunity to worship you in this way to thank you for the cross and for what it means. 
for the reconciliation back to you, back to our Father, so that now we can boldly come before your throne, not in shame, but in hope and in joy. Because our sin debt's been paid through the grace of your Son. Thank you so much for your love, for being an amazing Father. We just give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In your Son's name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my faith. Carry the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders. My soul now is stand. So what can I say? And what could I do? But I find Heart, oh God, completely you. So I walk upon salvation, spirit of life in me. It's life to declare your promise. So What could I do? But I find this heart, oh God, completely in you. What can I say? So what can I say? What could I do?
In our city you have moved in our God you came to us we sing and we shout and we sing we shout because in our city you have moved in our God you came to us we sing we shout the city you moved and we sing we shout because in our city you have moved in our God you came to us Cause in our city you have moved in our God You came to us And we say we shall Cause in our city you have moved in our God You came to us And we say we shall Cause in our city you have moved in our God You came to us So, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours, and all I am is yours, and all I am is yours, Jesus, all I am is yours. God, all we are is yours. We just give you this moment. We welcome your spirit in this place. We thank you so much for that gift of your son. For the ultimate sacrifice that you gave so that we could see you. So that we could live free, that we could run free and have our hope in you. God, on this Father's Day, we just honor you in this church, with this church, with our lives. We thank you so much for all that you've done for us, for always being there, for always loving us, just ready to come with open arms running to us. Pray that you be with Drew as he brings your message this morning. And we just thank you so much for who you are and for your son, Jesus. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you guys so much for having me today. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, really glad that Tim and Aaron decided to invite me to come speak with you all, to be with you guys, uh, worship today. I ran into him about two or three months ago when you guys went to Superstart. We kind of reconnected there and uh, had some lunch, and he told me that he's going to be out of town on Father's Day, and I happen to be up here for a wedding, so uh, lucky lucky for me, I get to be with you guys this morning. Uh, I was kind of a, a pseudo-member of Tim's youth group when he was back at Westside Christian Church in Richmond, Kentucky. My, my cousins went there on a weekly basis, but anytime I spent the night with my cousins, uh, of course, uh, I'd go to their church, and we'd hang out with Tim afterwards. We'd play paintball. We we ride go karts, and if, if my member serves me, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, I was never on the same team as Tim playing paintball. But I also don't remember Tim doing a lot of winning when we played paintball. I, I remember him getting peppered pretty well every time we played. So if Tim, you're watching uh, on the live stream, I hope you remember that, and I hope you remember getting shot in the face plenty of times by myself. But <laughs> Uh, I'm really glad that I'm here, especially on Father's Day, because 
I know. I love my father. And if you're a father, would you just go ahead and stand up for me so we can recognize you real quick? Give those fathers a round of applause. All right, you guys can have a seat. Uh, I love my dad. My dad is, if not my favorite human, one of my favorite humans on this earth. But he is not, he, he's not a really big vocal leader. That's not how I would describe him. He is definitely more like the Bruce Banner type than Tony Stark. He, he, he's not one that's very outgoing. He's not one that's going to talk a lot. He leads by example a lot. And so one of my favorite memories of my dad growing up is anytime I was up early enough, my dad was up reading his Bible all the time. We, we never had a lot of spiritual conversations. We never had a lot of deep conversations when I was a teenager. But I do remember him always setting this example for me. At the same time, because we didn't have a lot of deep conversations, he kind of dropped the ball in a few places. So to help you guys understand a little bit more about me and where I came from, I'll tell you some stories about times my dad dropped the ball, because that's always fun, right? So <laughs> you all have, any one of you that have kids or any of you that have uh, been through high school or middle school know that our schools today like to have the conversations with with the kids when it comes to how they're growing up and how their bodies are changing, right? However, schools are also required to send home a permission slip so that parents have to sign it in order for the kids to take part in the class. Well, my dad and my mom both never signed the permission slip. They thought they needed to have the conversation with me, which sounds great. Except one, I was always one of the weirdos that got stuck in the library staring at the wallpaper. And two, they never had the conversation with me. So the fifth grade conversation with like puberty and you need to start wearing deodorant, I missed that conversation. And to be honest, it came a little bit later when nobody wanted to sit near me or be around me because I stunk. I mean, th he missed the ball in that conversation and maybe a little bit worse. Uh, the talk he didn't have until I was a freshman in college, which <laughs> as he's talking to me through this, I'm like, Dad, if I haven't figured out who I am in Christ by now, this conversation's way past. Like, you, you have no chance if you're having this conversation this late. However, as little as my dad liked to talk to me back then, he, he still always set the example for me. And still, even last night, he sends me a text every single night telling me goodnight and that he loves me. And that's how special my dad is. He's always there for me. I can always call him. I, I love my father. Uh, and I know a lot of you are fathers, a lot of you love your fathers as well. And so today, I want to talk about the best father in the whole Bible. Any guesses on who that is? Abraham. This is a good guess. God, there we go. <laughs> Much better. I, I, I was going to give you major props if you got God on the first one. We are going to talk about God. Obviously, we're talking about the Bible. So that's easy to talk about God. More specifically, we're going to talk about the Exodus. Because the Exodus, I think, is one of God's most amazing moments. And rightfully so, because we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the Passover, the uh, Israelites coming out of Egypt. And it's an amazing story. And it shows off who God is and how powerful he really is. And he does it over and over and over again. But just to make sure we're on the same page, I, I want to make sure we, we all understand the story leading to the Passover and the Israelites leaving Egypt. And so you guys hopefully know that the Israelites, at the start of the book of Exodus, had been enslaved for 400 years, which is insane. They, they've been praying to be released for 400 years. I have a hard time praying for something for four days. And, and they went for 400 years praying that God would release them from their bondage. However, it, it took him a long time, and the whole time he was making a plan. He was developing a leader that they had nothing to know about. He was being developed in the kind of the, the backside of things. And so God was commissioning this leader, which many of you may know is Moses. And Moses, I, I always say that he had three things. He had a calling, he had clout, and he had the tools. If I was a better preacher, those would all have C's, but I'm obviously not creative enough to make tools start with a C or else it would be cools. And then that doesn't make any sense. So he had the calling, the clout, the tools. He was called by God at the burning bush, told that he was going to be the one that released all the slaves. He was going to be the one that set them free. He had the clout because he grew up right alongside the Egyptians. They knew who he was and he had connections that nobody else had. And then finally he had the tools. He had the staff. He had the ability to show miracles to the Egyptians. In fact, I, I want to play one 
video for you in just a second because as I was growing up, I grew up with the Prince of Egypt in that little cartoon movie. It was really cool back in the day, but there's an even better version of Moses going into Egypt and declaring, let my people go. And if you've seen the Charlton Heston Ten Commandments from 1956, I, I'm going to show you a quick clip of that just so you can bask in the glory of how amazing this movie was. We're not going to get to the really cool special effects, but just, just take a glimpse of this video real quick. What kingdom has sent you? The kingdom of the Most High. These must be ambassadors to an Indian tribe. Dead ones? What gifts do you bring? We bring you the word of God. What is this word? Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. The slaves are mine, their lives are mine, all that they own. I do not know your God, nor will I let Israel go. Who are you to make their lives bitter in hard bondage? Man shall be ruled by law, not by the will of other men. Who is this God that I should let your people go? Aaron, cast down my staff before Pharaoh, that he may see the power of God. I had a really hard time stopping the video there because after that we have this amazing cinematic moment where his staff turns into a snake and then two other two other staffs warp into snakes and the CGI back then was so amazing in 1956. So if you haven't watched the movie, you need to go back just because of the amazing acting like uh, Pharaoh's wife there. Amazing, great movie. But, but that just gives you a little representation of Moses coming back to Egypt, declaring that he is going to let the people go, asking Pharaoh to let his people go. But, of course, Pharaoh says no. Pharaoh says no ten times. And after every time he says no, God sends a plague that honestly escalates and get worse and worse and worse. If you don't remember the ten plagues or you've never heard them, these are the ten. The first thing that happens when Pharaoh says no is God turns all the water in Egypt to blood. The second, he sends hordes of frogs. Then he sends lice or gnats, followed by fleas, followed by the pestilence of their livestock, just all their animals dying away from sickness. They send boils on top of the whole nation, intense hail, locusts, darkness, and then, of course, the death of the firstborn. It gets worse and worse and worse throughout this. But imagine what it would have been like in those times. Because basically what happens through all of those plagues is that you are uncomfortable 24-7 no matter where you go. Because if you're outside, you're risking being around hordes of frogs or flies or gnats. You might get hit by hail at the moment. So when you come into your house, if you're able to block every door and window, then maybe you're safe. However, the boils... And the possibility of lice and the itching that had to take place at that time. Then, of course, there's the death of the firstborn. That was the most traumatizing event, uh, probably close to the top five in history, uh, of people just dying overnight. So no matter where you went, no matter what you did, you were uncomfortable. And so imagine what life had to be like for the Egyptians. But then the Israelites, luckily, when it came to the last one, they were saved as long as they followed a strict set of rules, as long as they did exactly what God told them to do, then they had nothing to worry about. God gave them two basic instructions. First, make sure you have packed everything up and you are ready to go at the moment's notice. And second, take the blood of the lamb and take it and swipe it over the doorway of every entryway going into a house. And then when the angel of death comes down into Egypt, they will pass over each of the houses that has the blood of the lamb but every house that does not, every firstborn son of any human or animal will die that night. And it was a tragic event, and it was finally the one where Pharaoh was ready to say, fine, I will let your people go. Because in that moment, he lost his son. 
But also in that moment, the Israelites began a tradition that would span for years all the way up to today. Jewish people still today practice the Passover because it was such an amazing event where God set them free but passed over each and every one of them so that they were not punished. In fact, if you're familiar with your New Testament, you read where Jesus was at the Last Supper and he was celebrating the Passover meal at that moment. It was an amazing event. However, I imagine it wasn't without headache, right? Because imagine for a second, you have probably a million Israelites leaving Egypt at that moment. Have you ever been on a long car trip with your kids? I mean, who's ever traveled more than 10 hours in a car, not a plane, 10 hours in a car with little kids? Anybody? Okay. Was that a positive experience? No, it's never a positive experience. I'm convinced that there's no amount of preparation, distraction, or snack action that's going to be able to stop the kids from turning into horrible rage monsters. And no matter what, no matter who or how old the kid is, it will happen at some point. I thought we were lucky. We were traveling, my wife and I and our foster twins, down to South Carolina from Lexington, Kentucky, and we made it eight of the ten hours. And then my little foster daughter, Alyssa, had a meltdown, and it lasted for two straight hours. Now, lucky for me, we had the car packed to the brim. Like, the kids were basically sitting on top of our stuff at that point, and there was so much stuff in the dash, I felt like Ricky Bobby with the Fig Newton sticker. Like, it was obviously really distracting. Those of you who laughed, I'm glad you watched that movie. (laughs) But it, it was an impossible event. Any of you who've traveled with kids know That's not fun, and they are going by foot. So I can only imagine if I had to take my twins by foot. Uh, And here's the path that they took. Here's a little map for you. You'll notice there's I put three on there because we're not 100% sure which one of these they took. But one of those three, the Israelites had to walk. And just so you know, the orange is the most likely, and the orange and green lines are both 50 miles that they took from the, the exodus where they were released in Egypt all the way to the Red Sea, which is the story we're going to read about in just a moment. And then if you, they happen to take the red course, that was at least 100 miles. So imagine those of you who have traveled in a car with your kids, taking them 50-plus miles by foot uh, in the middle of the desert, by the way. Probably not a fun event. However, it, they were probably at least happy and excited that they were free. They were ready to be out of Egypt. They were ready to move on to whatever was next. Whatever God had planned, they were ready to go. But of course, as you guys know, Exodus is only the second book in your Bible, so clearly everything wasn't positive from there. The adversity sets in right after that because in chapter 14, verse 5, Pharaoh has a change of heart. Look at what it says. Verse 5 When the word had reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. What have we done? Letting all these Israelite slaves get away, they asked. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot, called up his troops. He took with him 600 of Egypt's best chariots, along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with his commander. I don't know why they had to put that they took 600 of the best and then the rest of them. Like, just say all, right? Anyways, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so he chased after the people of Israel who had left with fists raised in defiance. The Egyptians chased after them with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all his horses and chariots, his charioteers and his troops. The Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they were camped beside the shore near Pihahirorath, across from Baal Zephon. So we see that finally the Egyptians catch up. The the Egyptians said, wait a second, we got to do the work ourselves now? Hmm, that's not going to jive with us. We don't know how many days this took. Most likely, since you saw the maps before, they were trekked about 50 miles, that this may have been like a week, two weeks. The text really doesn't tell us. But at some point, someone came to Pharaoh and said, hey, the pyramids aren't getting done. The statues aren't getting built. We're way, way, way behind schedule, and so that's when Pharaoh decides we are going to make a change. We are getting the Israelites back, and so he takes all of his people into the wilderness to try to catch up with the Israelites to bring them back. And when he finally does, what do you imagine that that moment was like? Just think, you've traveled 50 miles with your kids, probably with your grandparents. You're tired. You're probably irritable. And then all of a sudden, you look back, 
And in the distance behind you, you see the chariots of Egypt. I mean, the fear that had to set in was probably amazing, but I really like how the Israelites respond. Check out what happens next. It says, the Lord went before them by day. Um, yeah. Uh, by day in a cloud to lead them along the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. And they might travel by day and by night. Oh, sorry, I did skip ahead. Sorry, this is verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cry out to the Lord. They said to Moses, listen to this. This is, I, I, I want to start responding to people like this. It says, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this the way we said, uh, is this not what we said you, to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the wilderness. (laughs) Insane that the Israelites would respond in that way. But I love that response. Were there not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? Like, why did you make us track 50 miles out here just to kill us here in the wilderness? Like, we could have died in our, like, couches back home, and we would have been fine. However, he brought him to this point, and my thought process when reading through this is, how in the world can they think that? I mean, going back to the ten plagues that we talked about, are those not amazing supernatural events that took place? I mean, they've witnessed God after 400 years bring them out of Egypt. In the text that I accidentally pre-read, I'm going to read for you now. Listen to what else God does. He said, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. That was a chapter before in Exodus 13. Now, a lot of times I'm wishing that God would like just speak to me in a fortune cookie. Or he would like lay out some kind of sign that would just make it abundantly obvious what I'm supposed to be doing. These people had a pillar of fire leading them into the wilderness. And yet, when the first sign of adversity hits, when they look back and see the Egyptians, their first thought is, why did you bring us out here to die? That sounds outrageous to me, that people would see the frogs, they'd see the water turn to blood, They would witness all of these things happening in Egypt. They witnessed the firstborn death of so many sons of Egypt and how God passed over all of them. And yet, as soon as a little bit of adversity hits, the the Egyptians hadn't even caught up yet. They immediately start thinking to themselves, why in the world are we here? Our slaves' lives in Egypt would have been better. And the worst part of all this is, that thousands of years later, we do the exact same thing. Even today, we see God move. We feel God's presence. We hear his voice, and yet as soon as a little bit of adversity hits, we do the exact same thing. We question, why, God? Why would you do this to me? Why have you brought me to this point? When I was 14, I felt that touch from God. I felt him clearly speaking to me. I still have in my Bible, I was at a summer CIY event, and I felt God clearly calling me into some form of ministry. I knew that it was there. I knew this is what I had to do for the rest of my life. I still have the Bible that I can go back and look at. But a few months later, my grandfather passes away in this, just in the night, in the middle of the night, sudden. And my first response is, why, God? Why would you let this happen to my family? Even though I'd felt his presence before, in that moment, I questioned. When I graduated college, I was lucky enough to have my students' loans paid off, which I was, like, shouting for joy, lifting glory to the heavens at that moment. But for some reason, when I couldn't find a job, when I couldn't find a church that was willing to take a chance on me at the time, my first response why, God? Then, when, when my loving wife uh, was brought into my life, uh, I realized how blessed I truly was because there were so many days that I wanted to quit my job, but my wife was there encouraging me the whole way through it. And she was always there at my side, and she's never left me even to this day. And I was ecstatic that God would bless me with such a wife. 
But for some reason, when my wife and I have been unable to have children, my first response in that moment, why, God? Why are you doing this to us? Then, like I was telling the story before, we had two, uh, two, two twin, that's repetitive, twin foster children, right? And we were blessed with these babies. They came to us as ragged and, and dirty as children can be. We had them for 10 solid months, and I felt like, finally, this is what I'm called to do. And then they get taken out of our home for no reason whatsoever. They didn't even get returned to their parents. They got moved to a separate home, all because of a crooked system. And I immediately in that moment looked to God and asked, why have you brought me here? Why am I having to go through this now? And so even though I'd felt his presence in all of those moments, my first response when adversity hits is to ask the question, why? I'm sure many of you guys have been there, where you felt God clearly speaking to you, reaching out to you, holding on to you. But for some reason, when adversity hit you, what was your response? For me, specifically, After blaming God for my my situation, I try to take as much control as possible. You can ask anyone who knows me, I am a control freak. I need to know what's going on at all moments of the day. I need every moment planned out. I need to know the the A, B, C's, D's, all the way to Z's, and maybe twice of everything that's happening. And so when things go haywire, I need to take more and more control. But that rarely works. I think that's even more dangerous to, to put God aside and think in those moments, when things actually get worse, that we can do that ourselves. I, I imagine that for the Israelites, when they were looking back and they saw the Egyptians, there weren't just people chanting, why are we out here to die? I'm sure there were also plenty of people trying to take control in those moments. I mean, it's, it's Father's Day. Fathers, we're fixers, right? There's a problem. What do you do? Fix it. You find, you find the easiest possible resolution. When your wife's talking to you and she's letting you know what the problem is, your first response is always, well, how are we going to fix this problem? By the way, that's not what she wants. That's a whole other sermon. Anyways, we're trying to fix things. And so I imagine the Israelites in that moment had plenty of people trying to fix it. They're looking at the sea in front of them, the Egyptians behind them, and trying to figure out what are we going to do in this moment. There's probably one guy out there that's trying to build a boat to get across the sea. There's probably one guy trying to map his way around it. There's probably a few of them that are like, all right, what kind of weapons do we got? How are we going to fight? How are we going to get through this? What kind of battle plan can we come up with? But the only problem with each and every one of those moments is none of them included God in the plan. And so as the people are shouting, as the people are looking at Moses saying, what are you going to do? Look at how he responds. This is verse 13. And Moses said to the people, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. Verse 14 is the key. Pay close attention. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. How amazing is that? How amazing that we serve a God who in our, in our darkest moments, when we look behind us and see adversity, says, be silent, be still, watch me work. I'm without words at the thought of that when it comes to the hard moments in my life. If I had just had the faith to stand as Moses did at the bank of the river, and have faith in God to intervene instead of acting like the people behind him. How different would it have been? How different would it have been for you guys when you've had to face divorce, when you've had to face adultery, loss in your family, your, your parents, your grandparents, your, even your kids may have been lost way too soon. And your response in those times are more predicated on yourself than on the God that just wants you to be silent. Drugs, depression, anxiety may be tearing apart the fibers of your mind. But God's response still to you would be, be silent. Watch me work. That's rarely our response. But God is going to work. God's going to do amazing things if we just take one little step in faith. Let me read for you the rest of the story. 
some of you may know it, but pay attention to the little details of everything that happens in this freedom story. I'm going to start in verse 15. It says, The Lord says to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward, lift up your staff, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I've gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen, then the angel of the Lord of God who was going before you, the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud in the darkness, and it lit up the night with one coming near with all the other lights. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind, and all night... It made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground. Not soggy ground. Notice that. Dry ground. The waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. And all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning watch... The Lord in the pillar of fire and of the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared and as the egyptians fled into it the lord threw the egyptian into the midst of the sea and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and of all the hosts of pharaoh that had followed them into the sea not one of them remained but the people of israel walked on dry ground through the sea the waters being a wall to them on the right and to their left thus the lord saved israel that day from the land of egypt And Israel saw the Egyptians dead in the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. And so the people feared the Lord. And they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. What an amazing story. You know, when I was a kid in Sunday school, they just talked about the water being divided. But we rarely mention the dry ground or the pillar of fire descending to attack the Egyptians to give the Israelites plenty of time to get across we rarely talk about all the little details where God was working and all the people had to do was walk to freedom. I've only met most of you guys this morning, but my question for you is, in whatever situation you're living in, are are you trying to do this yourself? Are you trying to face adversity head on alone? Or are you going to follow what God says here and be silent? Move when he tells you to, but watch him work. Watch him do the amazing. Because he does it all through the Bible. This is just one amazing story. A- after this whole wilderness, a- after the, the people are ready to descend into the promised land, there are multiple times where God just shows up and fights for the Israelites, and they just stand and watch where God hurls rocks on top of people, where God forces people to kill one another instead of having the Israelites fight. And then more importantly, how about Jesus on the cross? I bet Mary Magdalene, I bet Mary, the mother of Jesus, I bet John were all just sitting there. I doubt they were silent, but let's face it, there was nothing they were going to do. But Jesus in that moment was working. He's still working today. He's still working in each of our lives. The, the whole sin problem that we have, you can strive all you want, and none of you, nor myself, will ever do anything about it. Any one of those people there that day when Jesus was crucified could have gotten on a cross with him, and it would have meant nothing. And the same is true for you. You can work all you want. You can try all you want. You can do all the things that you think are going to make the situation better. But the truth is, God is only calling you to sit and be silent and let him work. Because he's ready to do some amazing things in your life. I mean, 
God has not changed since this moment. God still works in some amazing ways. I've read the stories. You can find them on the internet and in books. God still works through pillars of cloud and fire. He does some amazing things even to this day. Most of the time, we're just trying to do our own thing when the problems hit. I was listening to a sermon on the way up here. I want to close with this. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the guy J.D. Greer, but I was listening to uh, a talk he was giving on Romans chapter 8. It was a powerful illustration. Uh, he, he told all the people that most of the time we think that sin, uh, the problem with sin, are the direct byproducts of it. Like when you lie, you ruin relationships. When there's adultery, it destroys your families. We think that's the problem. We think that's the worst part of sin. But what J.D. says and what Romans chapter 8 tells us is that the real problem that it creates for us is it creates separation between us and God. That we no longer have the ability to live in the Spirit in the same way. And that's the same problem here that we're facing. That when we face the hard times, when we face the problems, the danger is not what lies before, before us or behind us. The danger is that usually we think we can do it on our own. We, we usually think that God has brought us to this moment, and I'll take over from here on out, because clearly God doesn't know what he's doing, and, and I can handle this better. But again, if we really want to get through whatever you're facing, just be silent. Let God work. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this day. And I thank you... Um, for this amazing church that is seeking you and seeking your will and your calling for each and every one of them, Father. But my prayer this morning is that as this church and as each and every one of these people go forward, that they don't just try to be busy, that they don't just try to get the work done, that they don't just try to, to, to move and, and get the tasks accomplished, that when they face adversity, that they won't just try to move as fast as they possibly can, but instead, sit and be silent, Lord, so that you can work. And so I pray this morning, as we are sitting here silent, God, that you would move, uh, that you would do a great work in this church, uh, that you would do a great work in this city, uh, in each and every one of these people and in their families, Lord. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Let's thank, thank Drew for, uh, for coming and, and sharing the message this morning. I always feel like when, you know, when we get to heaven that I'm going to misconstrue Moses for Charlton Heston or back and forth because he is Moses, right? Not really. Um, I think we have a special, if you guys have the opportunity, um, thank Drew for being here today and hopefully he can come back again sometime and share uh, the message God's laid on his heart too and just continue to pray for him. And uh, what what God is doing with him and his ministry too, it's it's very awesome for him to come and do this this morning, especially on Father's Day. Um, I think we have like a special clip for um, the fathers too, so check this out. Sometimes it's hard to find some peace and quiet, so the bathroom is where I go. Me and my phone on the throne Checking YouTube, hitting like on some videos I know this won't win me dad of the year But come on, give me a chance now If the roll is done, I grab another one Set it right, set it overhand And now I'm singing Family, like you know I don't want much I even love handmade crafts made of macaroni Come on now, you should know me All I need is tasty craft beer, please Sometimes I might eat too much No worry about my weight, got the dad bod rocking on me Sketches on my feet, cargo shorts look good on me I'm a dad, that's what I do I get the groceries when I'm asked to The hair on my head's getting thin, that's true But I got lots on my body Me and your mom said clean your room But I'll probably forget about it real, real soon You can find me with a beer by the barbecue I'm a dad, that's what I do 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 You can find me with a beer by the barbecue I'm 
a dad, that's what I do. All right, so let's take some time and, and we'll celebrate our dads today and, and just have some fun. I think Quentin's got um, a special little trivia for the dads, too, so we're going to do something real fun. So obviously we're, we're extremely thankful for you guys, for all of you, um, and the dads. Um, pretty much everybody that's founded this church is, is a dad, um, and we all feel like we're a dad to the church. We kind of model it, and we do the, all, the, all the dad things, get paid for a little bit more, stuff like that too. So, um, so what we've done is we have two Texas Roadhouse gift cards, okay? So I'm gonna let you pick the category. I've got a couple. So we got cars, history, sports, and since we're in church, the Bible. <laughs> These are just things that I like, so you're gonna have to deal with it. So somebody pick a category. Sports, all right. So. I wasn't counting on you picking sports. All right. What is the only NFL football team to go undefeated, including the Super Bowl? Raymond. All right, another category. History? All right. This is mine. I'm a nerd through and through. All right. I make. I got the mic. I make the rules. <laughs> Who was the U.S. president during World War World War One? Got it, right there. Heck yeah! How about one more, just for the heck of it? Um, let's go Bible. What do you think? And I'll test you, because it's funny that I have this question, and we talked about Exodus. How many plagues? Did God inflict on Egypt? My wife missed that one like four times last night when we went through that. And I was like, we need to redo that. So, thank you guys. We're we're so we're so excited for uh, for what the church is going through, what the church is doing, and we're so thankful for our fathers. Y'all have a good day. <laughs>